Hello and welcome. Got any spoons? I'm your host, Anne, and my co-host, Amberlynn, Mrs. Lebeezy, is here with me today. How are you doing? I have two spoons. Two, two spoons. spoons. Fantastic. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to give a spoon rating today, but maybe I should start doing that. Uh, That's good. <laughs> welcome to the podcast uh let, just to let you know we are not doctors uh we do not give medical advice we do share our personal experiences and we have a lot of them <laughs> and that's so nice. we have some tips and tricks that work in our life if it works for you that's great we've started this year kind of a as an introduction to our shared diagnosis of hypermobile eds and um, knowing that there's 13 subtypes, there's a lot, but this is the one that's the most common and the one that we have in common. And today we thought we would talk about what has been dubbed by some, and one person would be Dr. Aaron Nance, as the unholy trinity, the comorbid, mm -hmm. and that is EDS is one, the MCAS or MAST MAST, M-A-S-T, cell activation syndrome, and then dysautonomia. Yeah. And I think, I think we should talk about dysautonomia first because oh. it's a spectrum. Yes. And a lot of people assume that the only dysautonomic disorder is POTS, post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Do you have POTS in Berlin? I do. It's my little pokey crying. It's one of my little buddies. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so tell me what you tell our audience what POTS is and how it how it affects you. Oh, for Please. sure. So, um, for POTS, me initially my symptoms were just the heart palpitations and my heart racing when I stood up or when I sat up. And um, it was determined through a tilt table test um, where they actually split, sprayed glycerin under my tongue. My heart went crazy. Like it oh. just started racing. And as soon as she sat me up, uh, like the table went from flat straight up to up straight. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to look at her and she's like, you got to stop fighting. It. I was like, I am not fighting it. And at that moment, I was like, oh, I should probably just... <clears throat> And I was gone. She was like, you mm -hmm. failed the test. I was like, oh, I tried. I practiced real freaking hard, man. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, they put me on beta blockers. So propanolol. And I was on a very low dose in general. Initially, they wanted to use it to treat my PTSD. So it was like to kill, kill two birds with one stone. Um, and it worked for me for a good two years. And I didn't have any issues until I got COVID again, um, this last fall. And the second day that I had COVID, I, my daughter had volunteered to bring home the class guinea pig and the guinea pig was in her room and she was out playing with her brothers. And I was like, you know what? I don't remember the last time she gave it. Hey, I'm going to go put some hay in its bowl because it always needs hay. So I go in there and I look at the guinea pig. I open its little crate and it's just staring at me with its little lip hanging out. And he's like, rah, rah, rah. I'm like, I'm going to get you. Hey, it's going to be fine. Don't jump out. That was my biggest fear is it was going to climb out and fall on me. I lean down to pick up the hay and I wake up on the floor. And I was like, well, what the hell happened? And I look up and the guinea pig is just standing over the edge of the crate, just staring at me like, did you forget? <laughs> I'm still hey, here. Hi. <laughs> Right. Yes. <laughs> Taking a nap. <laughs> Very considerate of you. Um, so I stand back up and I check my Apple watch. I really need to charge that thing. It's been the best form of monitoring my heart rate. Um, and my heart rate was at 210. I was like, oh, oh well, that would do it. You know, mm -hmm. I had been laying down in my bed and I was like, I need to feed the guinea pig. So I stood up, walked to her room, which is a good 30 to 40 paces. And then bent over and my heart just said we were done. Um, since then, I have started having, um, I started blacking out, especially while going up the stairs in my house. 
The snowfall vision is really bad where it almost looks like there's little splotches and mm -hmm. the further up it goes, it's more just white above that. Um, but once I get to the top of the stairs, if my head feels like it's going to explode, like there's a lot of pressure and my heart is racing and my, I black out. Um, yeah, it's, I did not realize that people could live with this. Um, it's been a very humbling experience, but I, I need to re-see my cardiologist and up my beta blockers because initially when we started it, the propanol all, all together, I had no pot symptoms. So going from no pot symptoms to fainting and blacking out and having snowfall vision was a huge leap for me after feeling like we had fixed the situation. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that um, they put you on the beta blocker. There is a specific medication um, that I'm aware of and had experience with a metadrin. Mm -hmm. So the way metadrin works is you set your alarm to wake up, you take the metadrin, set the alarm for 10 more minutes, mm -hmm. and then you get up slowly. Because if you get up immediately after taking it, I guess it gives you quite the migraine. Oh. Then they want you to sit on the edge of your bed and uh, uh, activate your larger core muscles, like do knee raises from the seated position, like extend your arms so your your arms are getting going and the blood is circulating and it um <laughs> I, i'm fine i am great i am so gonna be there in two seconds i just know it i have figured this stuff out i just know it it's not gonna do this to me it is mm -mm. totally this to me there we go hi i missed you oh i hope that our editing skills can cut that out um yeah so it helps raise the blood pressure uh just in general uh but i don't i don't have i have dysautonomia but i don't have pots mm. so what form, have, form of dysautonomia do you have well on the tilt table, I passed out, but my heart rate didn't go up. And then dysautonomia is all, any autonomic function of your body. So mm -hmm. it could be um, the digestive system, the circulatory system, you know, regulating your heat um, and different mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so definitely experienced all of those things, but the POTS diagnosis requires that your heart rate go up by a certain number. Mm -hmm. By 50 beats per minute. Okay. By 50 beats per minute. And I did mm -hmm. not experience that. So they said, yes, you have dysautonomia. No, you don't have POTS. That's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard other people say, uh, I, I'm wondering about the standardization of the tilt table test. Because I've heard people say that they had to get like a bolus of saline before they took the test so uh, they could rule out dehydration. Right. I've never heard of glycerin spray being used. I, when I made a video about it, there were only three other people in the comment section. That one, I think, got around 15,000 views. Mm -hmm. Three other people in the comment section only had ever had it. So I honestly wonder the same thing because I've heard so many different ways of it being tested. And the only way that I've found so far that's accurate across the board is actually doing the poor man's tilt table test. It's found on Google that you can do at home where you monitor your, your heart rate laying down and then you sit up and then you stand up and then you lay down. It, there's a step-by-step -step, like a wiki how-to. Okay. That I feel like that that's what I took into my cardiologist initially saying, Hey, I feel like I have this condition. These were my results from this test. And then we redid the test in his office. Oh, so okay. it was already a basis of, okay, we see you're having heart elevation and they did an EKG. My EKG was normal, no mm -hmm. issues whatsoever. So it was one of those, we checked up all the boxes we could do in our office. 
I guess we can spring for this test. Okay. And the hospital that it's done through is actually a really big hospital here in Tucson. It's called Banner. It's from through the university and all of that. So they have, from what I was told today, I actually went to lunch with Anne Marie. Uh, she's another local zebra here in Tucson. Uh, she said that there's actually a POTS clinic in the university medical system. So I'm going to look into hopefully going in that direction. But that's where I did my my tilt table test and all of that. So I have no clue. I, I And then uh, I've heard of other people who, because that's basically when the, you're toxic, when you're pregnant, they do that. They're like, mm -hmm. here, you know, stand up. They take your blood pressure, sit down, lay down, stand yep. up. Well, the tilt table, like you said, you were you were hor horizontal and then they brought you vertical and you went. Right. Uh, I I don't think this is accurate, but I'm not a doctor. No, um, it's fair. I've heard, heard when people are, one, they give you the bolus of fluid. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not dehydrated, but you did just bump my volume of blood. Probably. Right. I don't, anyway. And then they'll they'll do the the adjustment and then they'll wait 10 minutes yes what is that i have no clue i will have passed out and i will i will i will have had my vision go black and maybe i don't pass right. out but i'm um i'm standing there not being able to see eyes open and then you're gonna wait 10 minutes to take the blood pressure when i've resolved from the mm -hmm. tolerance well they have you sit up to do the last one you know s s sit up from laying down to do the last blood pressure after the 10 minutes of standing yeah, that's one thing they got me i i fainted while they had me upright they laid me back down waited until i came back to and then sat up and did the blood pressure again okay Well, got none of that. Like, I don't, I don't understand in general, like, especially if your patient is coming in with the tilt table test at home done. And if you do it with them in clinic, I don't feel like the final tilt table test should be necessary. I feel like it should, it could be a clinical diagnosis with a cardiologist. Well, maybe so. Maybe people would have luck with that. Um, yeah definitely and i guess my i bring up the inconsistency because like with so many other things that zebras deal with we're often more of an expert on our illness and definitely on our own bodies Absolutely. and you have to educate yourself and ask those questions if they're if they're doing something like waiting 10 minutes it's like i think you should take it like when i stand up take it, take it then, right. you know, it's, it's that delicate balance again of advocating, but not dictating your health and it's hard seeking help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, and, and that's the other thing we talked about with the bite, bite and scoring where doctors will say, yes, you meet those things, but you don't have enough of yeah. this thing that your skin doesn't stretch enough. That's not actually on the bite and scoring. The stretchy skin isn't. And so um, Correct. I was really excited to find a, a talk on a, a video on a new thing. I shared it with you and we're excited because we're going to research that some more and we want to bring it to you because it's not just the um, extremities and, and the traditional bite and scoring, it's a different evaluation. It looks really promising. We, we were, we yes. are really excited about it. Um, so we're going to make that a thing next week. Yeah. I just and reached out to the doctor before we got on this. So hopefully she'll respond to where we can get some, some more information on it because it's covering lifestyle things. Like things that we talk about in general of being a complaint that no one is taking seriously, but it's included in this as a possibility and putting towards EDS. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Much more multi system as I understand. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of us deal with the dysautonomia, not able to regulate our temperatures, uh, our blood pressures are wonky um, and uh, heart rates are wonky. And they often write that off as anxiety. My heart's yep. racing, doc. You're just anxious. Mm -mm. Calm down. Yeah. So how would you handle, how would you suggest some, someone, how, how do I say that? What's the best way in your experience to talk with a doctor about, um, like, it's not anxiety. My heart is racing. Is it, we're still going to go back to the poor man's yeah. total and. No. So my cardiologist was one of those that didn't know that POTS existed when I met him. Okay. So when I went in there saying that I was having palpitations, that was my initial complaint before I even knew POTS was a thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm having these palpitations. They immediately put you on an EKG. EKG comes back normal. Okay, well, are you stressed at home? Is there a lot going on and initially? I said, yeah, because we had just moved. So I was like, you know what? Maybe it was the move and maybe you were right. And then I get on TikTok and figure out that I have EDS. And then lo and behold, I find someone on TikTok, Microcat Machine, who is like the POTS guru. And I was like, are you freaking kidding awesome. me? Yeah. Are you, are we being, are we being for real right now? So I did the poor man's tilt table test at home. And I was like, all right, I have to go in there and say that I think it's POTS. Mm -hmm. And I told him, Hey, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the hypermobile type. And he was like, can you do that weird bendy shit? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can, but that's not why I'm here. And he was like, can you do it? Mm -hmm. And I did not know at that time doing these things would injure myself more. I wanted the, the conversation to continue. So I was like, all right, there you go. Did my little thumb to my forearm thing. And he was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's weird. Thank you. I think I have POTS. What is that? And do I diagnose that? And I was like, oh my goodness. Like they, we are starting ground zero here. All right, cool. Um, I explained what POTS was and I pulled up a Google, like Google what POTS was and the symptoms. And I was like, I have literally all of these. And around that time frame, the palpitations had gotten to the point where it would stop me in my treks while I was walking. And I was worried I was going to faint. I had only fainted one other time in my life when I was pregnant with my second. I had low blood sugar. Anyways, um, I knew that feeling, that overall dread of you're going to drop. And I tried to explain that to him. And he was like, well, you have generalized anxiety in your records. And you have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I felt myself getting, like, really hot and worked up. Um I unfortunately was at that appointment by myself. So I felt almost like I wasn't going to get anywhere with him. So I should just give up. And I said, you know what? Maybe it is. I'll, I'll follow back up after I see, because at the time I was physically currently in like PTSD therapy. I was going at every single week. Like I was so good about it. And I was like, you know, what? I'll talk to my fit, my therapist, see what he says. My therapist looks up POTS and he looks up my PTSD and he was like, we can just put you on propanolol. That might help. And I was like, I think it might let me talk to the cardiologist. I go back to the cardiologist and I was like, look, this would help with my PTSD. But if I do have POTS, this would help with that too. But I did find a poor man's tilt table test. And that is from what I found, one of the best ways to determine if you have it. And I okay. showed him an educational video on it. One I found on Google of another doctor explaining what the poor man's tilt table test was. And he was like, yeah, we can do that real quick. All right. Let's do it. Failed with flying colors, did the, did the best that I could. And he was like, you know what? I think we can get insurance to cover a tilt table test at the hospital. Okay. It was legwork. Like yeah. persistence. Yeah, definitely. Um, you... 
mentioned something and and, and now that it, uh, it escaped me fiddlesticks it'll come back i'm sure it will um with the doctors my puppy say hi i'm gonna guess my hubby <laughs> might be home um <laughs> Um, the dysautonomia and the tilt table test, but there's a spectrum. And then the, the other third part is the mast cell activation. Yes. I have mast cell activation. How about you? I do too. <laughs> yeah, we have mast cell activation. Yes, we do. We have mast cell activation. How about you? <laughs> hey, I did not get the the little um apple uh thumbs up, the little bubbles. What the heck? I know. It's playing games with you. It's gonna wait until you're almost done. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, it's not, definitely not what I ever want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. so tell me your mass cell uh story. Well, apparently I've had it since I started showing symptoms, as far as I know, back in 2018, right after I got out of the military, we moved down to Mississippi. And the only other time I've lived in Mississippi was on the coast, not in the middle of all the foliage. Um, and I was having these red splotches that would go on my chest and up my neck and onto the side of my face. It just felt hot. And then they would go away. So I didn't really think anything of it. A few years go down the road, COVID comes along, we're, we stay at home, and all of those symptoms completely stop. And I was like, you know what? I think it was just a fluke. Maybe I was allergic to something in Mississippi that I was rubbing up against. You know, maybe that was it. We get to Arizona, and all my symptoms go crazy. I would get all those patches, the hot patches up my chest, onto my neck, and I was getting them on my arms. I would start getting hives on my arms as well. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was mainly GI issues. I will start having rapid gastric dumping, meaning I will eat something and it's out of my system within 30 to 45 minutes. It's miserable. And I will experience histamine dumps, which is where out of nowhere, my body will get really, really, really hot. And from my scalp all the way to the bottom of my feet, I'll turn bright red like a little lobster. And then I get really sweaty. And then I get physically sick. And then I fall asleep for hours. Um, we still don't know what's causing that. But I'm allergic to my own sweat, my own tears, my own adrenaline, and a lot of the place where I live currently. So it's been fun. <laughs> right? Real quick before I forget, dysautonomia is often... It can be the gastroparesis that we were talking about. It's yes. an autonomic function. Um, so I will get, we'll get back to that one too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, who was able to diagnose your mast cell? I'm actually being seen by an allergist here in Tucson that just, she is a PA. Okay. She is straight out of, out of medical school and when I told her I had Ehlers-Danlos, she was like, do you have mast cell too? Like she got excited. And I was like, I don't know. That's why I'm here. And she was like, I know everything to do. Now, I do want to say the triptase testing and the patch testing are not an effective way to, um, to diagnose for mast cell. And that's What's definitely triptase testing. Triptase testing is basically where they will do a lab where you're not having a MCAS flare and they will text, text, test your triptase level. It's a blood test and that will give you your basic reading. And then while you are actively flaring, you have to go back in and get the secondary lab done. Oh. I have still, I still haven't done the secondary lab, but I didn't need to do the secondary lab. Because what I did was I took in all of the pictures of all of the MCAS flares that I have been having, like all of the patches. I take pictures of everything. I have a folder in my phone called medical. And uh, yeah, I, I showed her everything and I explained the GI issues I was having. And she was like, oh, girl, you've got MCAS. But mm -hmm. it's finding a provider that knows what MCAS is and knows what EDS is because they, they go hand in hand. Right. Definitely. Um, what about you? I've heard that the 
that the quote only way to test for it accurately is to do a 24 hour urine collection and then they test that for something really no um i was more like you i spoke to my geneticist and he asked the question and he was like do you do you find yourself um reacting like getting hives are you sensitive to things and like yeah yeah <laughs> How do Especially you know? chemicals. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and uh, so he's like, "Are you allergic to tape?" Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you you have mast cell. I and I and I I I could show him the pictures, but the, the gentleman. I mean, he was he was he didn't need to see him. He's like, Did the pictures look right. like this? And I'm like, Yeah, they. <laughs> Thank you for not making me like be, right. it feels kind of like you're in a court to me. I feel like I'm in a courthouse sometimes and I'm talking to the judge and I'm pleading my case. And it's so refreshing when you get a doctor that's educated and they're like, yes. How about this? And they're like, they understand. And they're, and they yeah. know like, Oh, the relaxation in my shoulders that happens instead of getting, and you try, I try not to get yeah. this when I'm like, when I'm pleading my case, but this is our life. This is our quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it can be maddening and, and frustrating. So um, that's another one to be aware of. And the fact that we did talk, I think last time, here's the thing we talk and I watch your, your TikToks. I am not as much of a TikToker as you are. I'm like, Wait, it's a lot. Did you talk about that, or did we just talk about that? I know I've heard it before, but <laughs> we need to do a better job of of keeping track of. No, just what... ask. I'll tell you. It's fine. <laughs> Here's no, 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 Amber. The, Amber, this is way worse. This is what I'm thinking in my head right now. I'm like, we've done this before. We did this last. <laughs> we talked. About this. I know. We've talked about, we, oh crap. This is part of last week's podcast. Like I got to do a better job of planning and scheduling and, and, and knowing what we're covering and things like that. But it is like everything. It has a beginning. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. If we're repeating, you know what? You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. It's still, it's there. So mm -hmm. um, uh, that's what's going on. And that's okay. Um, so gastroparesis is a big deal in our community yes. with the dysphenomia or the idea that our bodies have to work so hard to stay and, and the extra with the connective tissue that they're in the fight or flight. So it's been, uh, theorized that we can't rest and digest. Yeah. Um, so there's a few different reasons why, but a lot of people have problems with their tummies who have EDS. Right. Um, there's I mean, lots of different things that you can try or do, but it's very misunderstood. And did you know that one of the things about mast cell is when you have a reaction and your body is flooded with the cells it can cause very large weight gains because the cells are piling up in, in your body. It can cause swelling. For me, um, some of the worst, the worst pain I have is that the mast cells are collecting, as my geneticist explained to me, mm -hmm. they collect in my bones because um, we have... Our, um, we're more prone to osteoporosis. So there's, they're more porous. So your body fills those pores, especially as you get older. Um, Cause it wasn't a thing that I dealt with. I don't think in my youth, it's been very in the last four years Yeah, um, where I would describe it like a vice grip around my bone. It's not around my leg. It's not the muscles. Yeah. It's just the bone and it's crushing it. And I, made the appointment with my geneticist. I'm like, help, this is horrible. And so I know a lot of people also struggle with the fact that 
you don't have to be a hundred pounds to have gastroparesis. Yes. You can be overweight, malnourished, and much like we see in food deserts where people aren't able to get quality nourishment mm -hmm. and, and to then be obese. Well, your body's got to hold on to something and right. we're going to crave the things that our body can handle. And yes, it is likely going to be junk food. And then we're going, my experience is that we get at the lecture that we need to lose weight. Fed is best. <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and, and that's another challenge. And I think having yeah. The groups if you're if you're not a part of a support group either on Facebook or if you found a few people on TikTok or if you've done a meetup type of thing it's a big deal to be understood where you're at yeah and like I would love to eat a salad and have a steak and um collard greens and cauliflower cauliflower is brutal um, <laughs> It is. No, I hear you. That um, and broccoli. Mm hmm Yep. Yep. So. This used to be a couple of my most favorite vegetables. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure we've taken out a good size stock in goldfish. Goldfish, that, yeah. That is one of my safe go-tos. Even when I was back in the military, I was well known as the person who had baggies of goldfish in their pockets. Because I mean, it fills my belly. It doesn't it should hurt. Have been ducks should have been ducks. <laughs> and you know, it it works. But the biggest issue I have is like I go through these periods where I'm scared of food. Oh yeah. And when I explain that to the doctor, it's like, how can you be scared of food? Because it hurts when it goes down, and it hurts even worse if it has to come back up. And with me, because prior when I was in high school I did have an eating disorder so I don't like getting sick that is a very big ick for me I I don't like that mm -hmm. I can't control this mm -hmm. and it's been a mental game of okay is my body doing this to me or is now my brain doing this to me and I know I know very well it's not me doing it to me but mm -hmm. it hurts every time that that happens because you go through that mental game. Yeah. And like they don't get that. Oh no. No. Um, I know that I was referred to an eating disorder clinic and, and the terminology for what you and I experience is disordered eating. Yes. Because Traditionally, my experience, my knowledge of it is that eating disorders have to do with control or body yeah. dysmorphia and, um, or, um, or like a food scarcity, anxiety, trauma reaction type of thing versus right. I, if I eat, I have pain. So I'm mm -hmm. not going to eat. It hurts. Right. If you, I mean, the joke is you go to a doctor hitting yourself on the head and the do and you say, doctor, my head hurts. They say, stop hitting your head. Yeah. Stop doing the thing that's making it hurt. But when it comes to eating, they're like, you need to try, you need to eat. It hurts. Help yep. me. It, it, I want to eat. I'm not trying. I have hunger pangs. <laughs> <laughs> they're Definitely. there. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that's, I don't know, if you're a parent, have you, if, you, if you've experienced this, uh, poo breath. Yes. You're so backed up in your tummy and it's putrefying. And mm -hmm. you, my oldest. Your breath smells like poo. And uh, that's not fun. No, uh, but, but it, but that is, that is something that happened with my child. And that's how we knew when they were in big trouble. Yeah, we had no, we had no clue. Um, my oldest had a period where he, he got his, he's always been a little bit heavier, but we never attributed it to really anything. 
the EDS diagnosis wasn't new. It was new until two years ago to us. Mm -hmm. So now knowing that, now knowing quite a few years ago when his belly got super firm and round and he was like, I'm having stomach pains, I'm trying to poop. And we go in and it's severe constipation. This is something that's that's been going on for weeks, if not a month at this point. You don't realize these things because your kid says, oh, I have a tummy ache. Okay. We are a family of IBS and GERD and all of that. So I say, here, have a Pepto. We move forward from that and don't really look anything into it. But with EDS, the constipation is normal because all of those intestines and connective tissues can just keep expanding. And then until they hit their point and they're like, this stuff has got to go. But it doesn't contract and go down. Yeah. So there's the pelvic floor dysfunction. And then the other issue is it should someone experience megacolon. Yes. So um, I've heard horror stories. Mm -mm. I lost my father-in-law last year. And it, when we were called on a Thursday to say that he might not make it, yeah. he did last eight days. We were not prepared for eight days. I was not prepared. And I did not have my medications. I ended up in the ER. Oh, my goodness. My husband, my, my father-in-law passed away. And I was in so such severe pain. I couldn't not go. And they wanted to transfer me to a larger city mm -hmm. because I had megacolon and they said I was near bursting and I needed to have emergency surgery. But mm -hmm. I said, no. and instead I had soap water enemas for 19 hours with the doctor. I was discharged at 9 a.m. Being up all night and they were just for 19 hours pumping soap water stuff in me I'd hold it in as fast as as much as I could and at 10 o'clock I was at the funeral oh my gosh and th that was in a different town um very small town obviously they wanted to transfer me to a place where they could have surgery done right. and get back to a metro area where I live that's a good size uh, to the doctor that knows me that that prescribes my TPN and telling them that I've had this experience and they said don't worry about it don't worry about it no don't worry about it <laughs> but um so when you were talking about it hurts when you eat um, I've been weaning off TPN and I, yeah. I'll eat, but I am so scared that that's going to happen. And yeah. cause that's what did happen. I couldn't do the TPN. I was trying to eat, but not much. It doesn't take much. Right. Um, and, and so it was scary. It still is. And, um, it's that whole advocacy thing. Yeah. Again, um, I will have to add a trigger warning <laughs> to the video since we have talked about weight and loss and surgery and stuff. But in general, on my podcast, I've, I've addressed this when it was just me. It's our podcast now. It easy, is. Easy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also, I'm going to, we might have to cut this out, but I'm going to be real and i and that's yeah. what i think this podcast is about um we've discussed the fact that i have dealt with prolapses and yeah. i don't know how many edsers have female people with uteruses a lot have had their uteruses removed um but one of the biggest things for me if i get constipated is then it pushes into the yes. and then I have the prolapse is there 
if I can, and if you go to a urogynecologist or a proctologist, one of the questions is, do you have to manually manipulate parts of your body in order to have a bowel movement? Mm hmm. I yeah. did not realize that was part of that. So if you like, for me, it's, I have a whole lot more vaginal pain, like where my uterus was because yes. that, that it's called a vault. There is a space there. The vaginal vault is filling up with stool. And also you can have stool constipation. You can have a full on blockage, um, being TPN dependent. People are like, no, it's going yeah. into your veins. You can't be obstructed. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Your body's still absorbing the nutrients and creating waste. Yeah. Some people, I guess, don't have to, don't deal with that, but that is not the experience for everyone. Yeah. And my, cause I'm like, I asked my doctor, I was like, I'm TPN dependent. How can I be obstructed? He didn't know, but he said it happens. And I'm like, okay. Honestly, it makes so much sense now. My mom, um, my mom swears by fiber and she's like, you know, I, I have to have my fiber every single morning, not realizing that that's not what, that's not what normal people do. Mm -hmm. Normal people don't experience the fact that because there is more space for that waste to compact, it will. And until your body gets to the point where it's like, all right, let's use these muscles to contract this out. You'll just continue storing it. And you don't realize it until you've had this aching pain because you ignored it for the first few days because you didn't think it was that bad. And then it's a constant, ow, there's something wrong. You know, it's it's scary. And it doesn't have to be a pain in the ass. It could be right. in your hip. It could be in your belly. It could be, you know, in your shoulders. It, there's referred pain from that type of backup. And it's poisoning your body. It's putrefying. Right. It, it needs to come out. So mm -hmm. the, the weird symptoms that people deal with and then don't realize are connected. And yeah, but they are. So I, I'll get pain in my kidneys. Initially, mm -hmm. I was going in thinking I was having kidney stones and I would get, no, you're constipated. You need to poop. Yes. Okay. It's all good. Do they want you, and my family is here too. Uh, that is what we also share is family responsibilities and we love our families. So yeah. um, I'm excited. Let We're going to talk to or try to talk to the doctor who brought up this new um, thing. And that's what we're going to talk about if we can next week. Um, and we'll post about it. Um, yeah. I did have something to share, but it's way over there. That rhymed. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, you are not alone and you are loved. So we will talk to you next week. Okay. <laughs> All righty.